Uh, good evening. Hi. We're going to start in just uh, two minutes, but if you will take this moment to turn off your cell phones, that would be great. Okay? Would you do that? Thank you. Once again, good evening. Um, in this evening's reading, uh, I'll introduce Nick Del Banco, and Howard Norman will introduce Francine Prose. The most recent books by Nick Del Banco are highly original nonfiction studies, one on the art of old age, the other on the art of prodigies who did their major work when young. Nick did a great deal of reading and research on his way to these recent books, but in truth, he is entirely equipped to write about these subjects on the basis of his own long and deep experience. Nick has been writing fiction, publishing fiction, for about a half century, and his early novels were celebrated as the work of a very young person, prodigiously gifted, promising, and already enormously accomplished. In these recent works, largely devoted to the exertions of other artists, Nick manages also to use himself as, what to call it, a case in point, an object lesson, a goad. He notes that when he published his first novel in 1966, he was 23, and enjoyed generous reviews, job offers, and even a film version of that first book. Clearly as we would say, a success story. Though then, the success would soon come to seem not merely decades, but a century, a millennium ago, as Nick puts it. Why? Because with his subsequent, more resolutely experimental novels, he became, this is a quote, a novelist more recognized than read. The point in this, to note, one of the ways in which the literary roads taken or not taken have a great many turns and byways. How to think about that? At least in part, Nick suggests, by acknowledging that success has what he calls gradations. The goal for the truly ambitious artist may well be the production of masterpieces, but then the goal may also well prove to be urgency, excitement, a conviction that this life can be expressed in and celebrated by music, art, and literature. That conviction is everywhere discernible in the writing of Nick Del Banco, who really does believe that the thing, the essential thing, can be done and must be done. No shirking, no moves designed to show how impossible the task, how heavy the lifting, with Nick, we are taken by the fluency, the sureness of touch, the perfect matching of dark to light, surface to depth. Quote, Alice was 20 and going to Skidmore and finishing school by the skin of her teeth. So begins a chapter of Nick's 2004 novel, The Vagabonds. Quote, it was boring, 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 and she hated her professor and how he was making them study the origin of the species and how dull it was. Dull, dull. The better word was blame. He was to blame for making them read it." Unquote. It may be that I respond so ardently to that passage because, well, because I am young Alice's professor here at Skidmore, <laughs> making her read Darwin, and yes, boring her to distraction. <laughs> Delicious to be put there in young Alice's head 
and to feel that surge of blame that takes her over. But then the passage is so adeptly orchestrated that you don't have to feel personally implicated to savor its quiet, exemplary virtues. Nothing in Nick's passage remotely boring or dull. Of course, there are writers and writers. You don't get from Lydia Davis what you get from Marilyn Robinson, goes without saying. With Nick, always you get fullness and efficiency, deafness and candor. Nick is characteristically tender with his people and often surprisingly funny and elegantly aphoristic. Every now and then in reading him, you catch yourself marveling at how much pleasure you take in observing how he does what he does, even as you engage with the action. Someone once said of another master that reading him was like riding along in a top quality car, only to find that after a mile or so, someone throws the steering wheel out of the window. <laughs> You'll never feel the steering wheel has been thrown out the window when you're reading a Del Banco novel. But you'll know you're riding along in a top quality motor car and that its maker expects you to be savvy enough to delight in every aspect of the ride. Nick Del Banco. You've heard this already. Uh, we all travel distances, uh, in my case, roughly a thousand miles in order to hear such an encomium and introduction. Um, I think I'm gonna just sit down and ask him to repeat it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Robert. Wonderful to be back, wonderful to be here. I am gonna read from uh, my most recent uh, publication, The Art of Youth, which is principally about a, a wonderfully gifted young writer, Stephen Crane, ditto painter, uh, Dora Carrington, ditto musician, uh, George Gershwin. But it is about, uh, as the subtitle suggests, the nature of first acts. And I thought uh, this evening, because um, we are here in the presence of uh, those who are engaged in the first act as well as those who are um, old hoofers that I would um, uh, start with the, the general condition, the general circumstance uh, and then move to the particular uh, which is my own. You have no reason to believe this but I once was young and therefore can qualify um, as somebody who did, as Robert said, start rapidly out of the blocks. Anyway, here's uh, the more general case. Prodigy. According to the Oxford English Dictionary, the word has little to do with chronological age. Its first definition is something extraordinary from which omens are drawn an omen, a portent. The next usage is an amazing or marvelous thing, especially something out of the ordinary course of nature, something abnormal or monstrous. Only a much later meaning associates that amazing or marvelous thing with youth, describing it as a person endowed with some quality which excites wonder, especially a child of precocious genius. The words precocity and prodigy share no etymological link. By now, uh, root. By now, however, we routinely link the two. A prodigy is youthful. The prodigy at 50 seems a contradiction in terms. Nor is such early achievement always and only artistic. There are prodigies in mathematics and skating, chess and foreign languages. Prodigy is the name of an English electronic dance music group and a computer service. To be prodigal, as in the prodigal son, is to be wasteful or extravagant. To be prodigious is to be marvelous, but also ominous 
portentous. The word itself comes from the Middle English prodige, or portent, from the Latin prodigium, and the first known use was in a chronicle in the year 1494. Many wonderful prodiges and tokens were showed in England as the swelling or rising of the water of Thames. We've traveled a fair distance from the notion of a rising tide to the notion of an artist in the first flush of youth. The latter is my topic. The art of youth concerns itself with men and women, writers, painters, and musicians dead before the age of 40. In one sense, this is neither out of the ordinary course of nature nor amazing, since many creative artists died by then and continue to do so today. They are legion in our history. Indeed, and though I've done no statistical survey, it's safe to say that most of our acknowledged masters completed their lives labor by that age. The preponderance of what we honor as cultural achievements has been produced by the young. Much of this is a matter of actuarial tables and life expectancy. It's only in the recent past that 40 years old could seem young. Two score was once a full lifespan, not now. But my artists started quickly and were accomplished in their chosen fields by their early 20s. What they did, they did fully and soon. A separate inquiry might consider those who toil on with diminished effect or those who simply choose to stop, since not all creative labor ends with diminution or death. There are those in their 60s and 80s whose best work was done first. For the sake of coherence, however, I examine youthful figures whose talent was extinguished with their final breath. On September 9, 1513, when he was 17 months old, James V became King of Scotland. 17 months old. James V became King of Scotland. James VI received that title even younger at 13 months on July 24, 1567. In 1603, at the venerable age of 37, he succeeded Queen Elizabeth I and became James of England, which he then ruled for 22 years. Louis XIV, the Sun King, succeeded his father at the age of four years and eight months. His country at that time had 19 million people and he owned their bodies as well as their property. Pope Benedict IX, when 12th, assumed the position of pontiff in 1032, the youngest in the history of the Roman Catholic Church. The current Dalai Lama was enthroned in Tibet at the age of five in 1940. He remains the spiritual leader of his people, although in exile from his homeland and unable to return. Kang Hai became emperor of China in 1661 when he was not yet seven years old. He reigned thereafter for 61 years with three empresses who presented him with 35 sons of his own. Power, at least in its titular and inherited guise, can come soon. But what of power that is neither self-anointed nor appointed? Let me start with literature, since of the three modes in my study, it's verbally expressive and can describe the problem. As William Butler Yeats proclaims, perhaps a touch too loudly, I have drunk ale from the country of the young and weep because I know all things now. <laughs> in A Defense of Poetry, 1821, Percy Bysshe Shelley asserts that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. His phrase, too, is hyperbolic. But what are those unacknowledged legislators we call important writers? When does their reign begin? To die in one's 20s or 30s is not necessarily to have been a beginner. The poet or the musician or painter may well confront mortality at an early age. When T.S. Eliot has his titular character, J. Alfred Prufrock, declare, I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottom of my trousers rolled, the writer himself was in his early 20s and his alter ego only a little older. 
The spinsters in Jane Austen's books are rarely more than 30. When Shakespeare wrote his celebrated sonnet on old age, that time of year thou mayest in me behold, he would have been what we consider young. The medical student John Keats, who recognized his own arterial blood while coughing, was no less aware of his physical decline than Walter Savage Lander writing Memory at 90. When Patti Smith composed Just Kids, her companion Robert Mapplethorpe had died years before in his mid-40s of AIDS. Mortality has been a topic for painters, writers, and musicians all along. But life that ends at 20 is a different thing than life terminated at 80. And many of our culture's masterworks have focused on the former. A death that arrives in the fullness of time is less often the subject of elegiac lament than death that seems premature. From Achilles on Patroclus to John Milton on young Edward King, the literature of mourning deals with a lover or a friend dead ere his prime. Near the start of his great elegy, Milton puts it this way, for Lycidas is dead, dead ere his prime, young Lycidas, and hath not left his peer. When Edgar Allan Poe composed The Raven or wrote grievingly of Annabel Lee, he was lamenting the loss of a maiden, not a mother or grandmother. In the various fables where death comes to claim a prized lady, it's predictably a beautiful virgin, not crone, he carries off his prize. And when a life is over soon, the speculation on what if seems almost unavoidable, as though a second act might plausibly have followed with a second roll of dice. I think I'm gonna uh, get um, personal and particular um, for the rest of my brief time here on earth, or at least at the podium, um, <laughs> and um, read a couple of passages about my own, uh, not pre precisely prodigious childhood, but one that I do remember, more or less. Um, let me see. We all invent our pasts. I cannot remember the moment when I began to speak and cannot remember the moment at which I decided to write. Rather, and naturally, the whole is a continuum. It's a series of moments and set of lines crossed that appear far clearer in retrospect than they ever did in prospect. To take one such example, I do remember learning how to read. I had just turned six years old and was with my family on the SS Queen Mary crossing from Southampton to New York. I was a little British boy, which is why I talk so funny. Um, on the third day of the voyage out, being uh, past some, having passed some watermark that meant we were closer to America, I received my first pair of long pants. And that afternoon, sitting cross-legged on the stateroom floor, so proud of my flannels, I hated to crease them. The sun through the portal, spotlighting the letters, I taught myself to read. It was a book about boats. There was a lighthouse, a bridge, a series of ships, from trireme to frigate, canoe to destroyer, with two whole pages devoted to the fireboats, their spray a white, wet arc. The captions distinguished between them so could I. The alphabet's tumblers went click. I remember the feel of it, the pride in it, the pleasure, the way the world made sense. I think I remember telling my father I had no time for shuffleboard. I know I took the book up to the deck for tea. It was wonderful the way the lines pictured this life I was leading. Everything signified, everything fit. Our steward was called Jonathan. I recognized his badge as his spelled name. The rest of the trip is a jumble, 
But this sudden perception of order, the deck chairs ranked in rows like language, how a page is organized and why you turn it when, remains indelible. I learned to read that day. Many years later, however, I was sorting through some papers in the attic of my father's house. He was moving one last time, and I'd come to help discard the past's detritus. In a box full of grade school report cards, letters home from camp, and other such accumulation, I came across a book titled Henry's Green Wagon. It was familiar faintly. It conjured up Great Britain, not the United States. The boy on the disintegrating cover was pink-cheeked and wearing blue shorts. I read the inscription. To Master Nicky Del Banco, it said, the best reader in Miss Jamaica's kindergarten class. Congratulations, first prize. Miss Jamaica's was the school across the street. Like any other English child, I'd been taught to read before the age of six. So the memory is false. It's clear, but confused. Although I remember the school, the vast seeming meadow I would traverse on the way home, the hedgehog's lair, the where my aunt would shepherd us, a clearing in the woods that I called Hansel's house. Though I remember much of this, I'd forgotten I knew how to read. There are explanations, probably I learned in stages. Maybe I faked it with Henry's green wagon, having memorized the book and turning the pages when it seemed proper to turn. That sunshot moment on the Queen Mary may have illuminated something else instead. The transatlantic crossing was a rite of passage after all, and what I learned while sitting on the deck chair may not have been the alphabet. Therefore, the critics question, how accurate are such accounts? And I'm going to close with what I assure you is an accurate account of um, the beginnings of my uh, career as a writer or the moment when I kind of got it. Robert has flatteringly referred uh, to that book, which was my first novel um, and did appear when I was a little older than the boy crossing, but still young. The Hospital of Rhodes squats on the hill that rises to be Monte Smith. This is the first sentence of my first novel, The Martlet's Tale. And I wrote it again and again till satisfied. Whatever its merits or failings, it's a line on which I worked hard. Then there came the next line, then the next. I can remember sitting, those were the days of the portable typewriter, at a lamplit table in the pre-dawn dark, or with my Smith Corona on my lap, on the east-facing stoop of a hut on Martha's Vineyard, with the sun rising in the early morning, or in a warm and bright mid-afternoon, and focusing, or trying to, on my self-imposed allotment of 500 words a day. I had no telephone or television set. This was long before the era of the cell phone or computer. The silence would be broken only by a distant car or dog or gull or gust of wind. I'd read that Thomas Mann and Anthony Trollope had the daily expectation of a certain number of words composed. Theirs seemed like models to follow and a good habit to have. Now, with the advantage of hindsight, it's clear I was establishing what would become a lifelong routine. I didn't attend a writing conference or earn an MFA degree, less widespread then as initiation rites for the professional writer than is the case today. But all young artists must, I think, acquire their own systematic procedure. This was when and where I found mine. My daily employment was in a fish market, Poole's Fish Market in Menemsha, where I'd report at 8 a.m. to load the fish truck with swordfish and crates of lobsters for delivery down island to the Woods Hole Ferry or to restaurants in Vineyard Haven, Edgartown, Oak Bluffs. 
the easy banter of the fishermen seemed like a language to learn. I reveled in the job, the reek of fish, my calf-high rubber boots, the bushels of quahogs and cherry stone clams. <clears throat> Taking the back roads of the island, wearing a green shirt with the logo, pools stretched, stitched across its pocket, driving with the windows down to savor the inrushing mixture of air, pine needles and sea rack and wood smoke, shifting gears and singing loudly to myself off key. I felt both a part of the work force and a word surf set free from the desk. My boss was a gruff New Englander whose father and grandfather had been fishermen, as would be his own son in turn. This is true, his name was Everett Poole, his father's name was Donald, his son's name was Donald, his grandfather's name was Everett, and his grandson's name would be Everett. They had a limited imagination, but an almost <laughs> finite, um, uh, infinite reach. Uh, so, <clears throat> Uh, my summertime co-workers were the children of the privileged, and all of us felt lucky to earn Everett Poole's derision. You call that a fillet? You call that floor clean? With his three stooges, me, uh, this is true, and the sons of the dean of NYU and the president of Yale, <laughs> uh, he was stern and imperious and fine. He'd calculated, or so I assume, that our presence behind the counter would bring in friends or relatives as customers, the moneyed folk of Martha's Vineyard who found our presence charming and stopped by to say hello. Each morning he berated us, chomping on an unlit cigar, telling us to lift the swordfish higher as we raised it in the pickup's bed, to wipe down our filleting knives more carefully, to cut closer to the bone. He worked harder and much more efficiently than any of those he employed. His brusque bluster, too, was picturesque, an island character who took no guff from millionaires or cabinet members and stars. I myself was paid nothing, next to nothing in cash, though I could take home dead one-clawed lobsters or little necks whose shells were badly cracked. At 10 minutes to 8 each morning, I drove to the dock in my Alfa Romeo convertible. <laughs> Uh, then traded it for a broken down Dodge delivery truck with its loose clutch and battered tailgate, feeling as happy behind the one via wheel as the other. I did this for four years, working from Memorial to Labor Day six mornings a week. Sometimes I accomplished my language quota before duty kicked in. More often I returned to the windswept hill and chill mark at noon. My days were half days only and wrote till the limit was reached. And then it was time to go out in the world, to go for a swim or a walk on the beach, to take my kayak to a pond or attend a party. In this fashion, I was introduced to many of the local writers, Art Buckwald, Max Eastman, Leon A. Dell, Shirley Ann Grau, Lillian Hellman, John Hersey, Felicia Lamport, Joseph Lash, William Styron, and others. Saul Bellow, Bernard Malamud, Philip Roth, and John Opdyke passed through. They made me welcome at picnics, games of Scrabble, anagrams, the ceremony of drinks. Then one morning in late August 1966, with the Martlet's Tale just published and my job starting soon at Bennington College, I was carrying a crate of lobsters down the street in Edgartown. A girl in tennis whites approached me gushing. Aren't you Nicholas Delbanco? Yeah, sweetie, what's it to you, I said, sweating, relighting my pipe. <laughs> well, I'll be in your class this September, she said. And I remember thinking I looked distinctly unprofessional. <laughs> Buttoning my shirt, I said, that's nice, my dear, and what might your name be? And knew my days in the fish market would be thereafter numbered. What has continued to accrete is language, 500 words a day. The third page of the Martlet's tale begins, she was old, or Setha Prokopirios. This was the name of the grandmother whose buried treasure powered the plot of the novel, 
and for weeks I dithered over the lion's proper formulation, or said that Prokopirius was old would have made more sense. But I told myself, and nearly half a century later can remember making the decision that the first of these two versions sounded somehow like a translation from the Greek, and at any rate, more quirky and inflected. For inflected today, I'd substitute affected and would change the line to standard English, but all such waters long under the bridge. Like any other author, I would write a phrase over and over, playing with the rhythm and the sequence of the syllables, convincing myself that an and or an or was crucial to the line's success, declaiming my prose to the echoing air and arranging the shape of the sound. Apprenticeship has many guises. I served mine out on a hilltop off the coast of Massachusetts in the mid-1960s. I know, of course, how fortunate I was to start to write seriously there and then, how well healed was my poverty, how happily abjured my celibacy, how intermittent my silence and focused my devotion. Born vineyarders would say that they were going to America when they took the ferry off island. I myself left long ago and have returned only rarely. I married a girl from America whose allegiance is to Cape Cod. I open little necks and oysters now with a less practiced wrist. I've not seen or eaten, much less delivered, a hand harpooned swordfish in years. I no longer teach at Bennington or call New England home. Much changes and has changed. But the labor of writing a sentence, rewriting it, rewriting it, is still a labor I love. Thank you. What does it mean to call a novel fearless? Which is what I call Francine Prose's Lovers at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932. Edmund White, in his front page New York Times Sunday Book Review, attends to Francine's fearlessness as a creator of fictional characters when he writes, Francine Prose is a subtle psychologist and compassionate humanist, but nevertheless, she has created a genuinely evil character in Lou Villars, a cross-dressing French race car driver who collaborates with the Nazis and tortures resistance at Gestapo headquarters. Personally, when I think of the remarkable and very complicated figure of Villars, I'm reminded of Chekhov's phrase, pernicious charisma. It's, very, it's really um, very exciting when Francine publishes a new novel. <clears throat> but I must say, uh, you know how some critics or reviewers might write, nothing in this author's antecedent works prepares us for the accomplishment of, and then they name the new novel. So let me take the opportunity to say that with Francine's new novel, the absolute reverse is true. And it has to be true of someone of such astonishing originality because what readers have with remarkable and really almost unprecedented consistency experienced since the publication of Judah the Pious in 1973 and with each of the 16 works of fiction since are autonomously and equally splendid reading experiences. Novels, short stories, children's books, critical and personal essays, there is no more eclectically accomplished writer in our literature, really. Last month, I caught up with reading Francine's introduction to A Man's Place by Annie Arnault. And just last week, um, I caught up with her um, 
I'll just say probing review of Donna Tartt's The Goldfinch <laughs> in the New York Review of Books. So I say these things um, because I must admit that for decades now I've been a passionate archivist of Francine's writings. What does it mean when one says a writer is indispensable? Well, first, it's one thing to have the breadth of erudition that Francine exhibits in Lovers at the Chameleon Club, but it's quite another to have actual historical facts and personages engaged in a duet of such perverse complicity with literary verisimilitude. The lives of Francine's Parisian characters just before the war and into the war, no matter a street sweeper or Picasso, are all in their own way in extremis. History has put them there. The betrayals, the erotic metaphysics, the nocturnal phantasmagoria of a world on the brink of horrific catastrophe, where every moment seems full of tragic sense of implication, are, in Francine's novel, as Virginia Woolf put it, out in full, wildly tragic regalia. And I turn again to the word originality, because it means that a writer has an exacting imagination and the emotional and psychological dimensions of their writing always, in some way or another, intensifies and clarifies life in unforeseen ways. Because that is what we want in literature, don't we? Originality. It is the rarest thing in the world. But I know someone who can say this far better. Because I found a letter, actually my wife Jane found a letter, from 1974 from the great poet William Merwin, while he was then living in the south of France, and he wrote, quote, I'm having Athenaeum send you a copy of Judah the Pious by a writer of your generation, and it is absolutely original and yet mythic in the sense of timelessness in language, and on top of that, a beautiful and haunting and magnificent story. Merwin could not have known, but he may well have intuited that a sense of timelessness in language would apply to Francine's writing for decades to come. Which brings me back to Francine's new novel. Every scene, every incident, every conversation, often conversation as a form of subterfuge, is brought to readers with, if this reference isn't undignified for such a stunning work of literature, cinematic immediacy. Certainly it can be said that one hasn't experienced so vividly, perhaps since Isherwood's Berlin stories or Eric Kastner's Going to the Dogs, this time period and certainly never with Francine's refinements. Her novel is so full of frenetic decadence, pathos, and calamity. Lovers at the Chameleon Club is a complete historical symphony of a novel. Francine Prose. Oh my God, <laughs> I can hardly go on after that. I, it's a great pleasure and an honor to be here really, um, to read with Nick and be introduced by Howard, both of whom are not only dear friends, but whose work I admire enormously. One, one of the dirty little secrets of being a writer is that it's never enough. No matter what, the good review, the prize, it's just not enough, it's not enough. But um, <laughs> after Howard's introduction, I, I could, uh, well, it's just fine. <laughs> it's just <laughs> fine. So thank you, Howard, really. And the letter from Merwin, yikes. OK, oh my god. So um, <laughs> I'm going to read from Lovers at the Chameleon Club, Paris, 1932. Um, this is a section from about, so from about 100 pages, a little more into the novel. Someone this morning, asked at the, this afternoon at the Q&A, asked what my fa who my favorite character in the novel was, and I said, um, it was the character, uh, the Baroness, the Baroness Lily de Rossignol. She's a um, art collector, a patron of the arts, a collector of photography. She's very rich. She's married to a um, manufacturer of luxury automobiles and race cars. And, and like practically everyone else in the book, she's at work on a written document, in her case, a memoir called A Baroness by Night. Um, and I'm going to read for this. I th uh, even though it's <laughs> even though it's well on in the novel, there's nothing really you need to know. The Chameleon Club is a um, 
It's a club for cross-dressers in Paris, in, uh, in Montparnasse. From A Baroness by Night, by Lily de Rossignol. Oh, I've made some cuts through here for reasons of length and time, so there'll be a few glitches, but hang in there. Through much of the 1930s, the Chameleon Club was my favorite night spot. I adored the clientele, the dancing, the costumes, and, for a while, the floor show. It provided a soothing antidote to the more stressful aspects of my life, among them my hopeless love for the photographer Gabriel Seigny and a possibly related rough patch in my marriage to Denis Didi de Rossignol. It also offered a brief distraction from politics, history, and from the terrifying uncertainties of the moment in which we lived. Whenever I imagined to rise above my personal problems, it was hard not to notice that half of France was unemployed, that Hitler had seized power next door, that murderous gangs of extremist, extremist thugs were rampaging through our city. Because I counted so many talented artists and foreigners among my friends, I was alarmed, even repelled, by the rhetoric of the right. On the other hand, I feared that if the communists won and the upper class went under, so would my husband's auto business and all our employees. Though later, the news out of Soviet Russia made me realize that Rossignol Motors would have done just fine selling cars to party officials. In an atmosphere so unsettled, one might think that something more was required to lighten our mood than a lively drag show, a noisy crowd, a room full of dancing same-sex couples. But one can never predict, predict what will enable a person to get through the night. The Chameleon Club has had a long afterlife, more importantly, in Gabriel's photos. It also appears in the cult classics written by our American friend, Lionel Main. I've seen it mentioned in books about the history of the period and popular culture in Paris. But unless you were there, you cannot understand why it was so beloved, why one felt so happy to stand in front of its door and whisper its well-known secret password, police, open up. <laughs> in part, what made the club such a haven was its power to make each person feel temporarily less alone. As someone who has always abhorred crowds, a horror I shared with Gabor, it wasn't the crush of dancers I enjoyed or the smoky air, nor the illusion of community, the shallow, unreliable reassurance of being together with strangers whom we want to believe are like us. What moved and gladdened me was that the club's popularity, its longevity, and its very existence seemed to prove that each of us leads a double life. When we say a double life, what do we think of first? The mousy government bureaucrats selling secrets to the enemy, the hired assassin masquerading as a country housewife. No, when we say a double life, we generally mean sex, bigamy, infidelity, an infinite continuum of so-called kinks and perversions. The self who touches and is touched in the dark between the sheets is not the same self who gets up in the morning and goes out to buy coffee and croissants. Or anyway, so I was told. By the time I joined the resistance, I'd had considerable practice in secrecy and stealth. As with most people, my secret involves sex. But in my case, it was the lack of it that could never be mentioned. All through those years, in fact, until the early days of the occupation, I remained a virgin, even as I projected the world-weary, jaded sophistication of a woman who has tried everything and experimented so freely that with no new frontiers to cross, she is retired from her strenuous erotic explorations. <laughs> I suppose the reason that I was assumed to be a degenerate libertine were the four years I'd spent in Hollywood. In Paris, at least in the circles in which my brother-in-law Armand moved, that was the equivalent of 50 years in a brothel. <laughs> California was where I'd met Didi, but no one ever suggested that it had corrupted him. Possibly you have seen me in the films of that era. I was the blonde in the scanty toga, shyly draping a, draping a wreath around the neck of the sweaty, muscular Christian climbing out of the gladiator pit. 
I was the prostitute cradling her baby in the doorway when the mad scientist dashes by en route to his demented experiments. <laughs> I was the handmaid who catches the third of Salome's tossed off veils. Then little by little, roll by roll, I faded back into the crowd. I was one of the cannibals fleeing the volcano that saves the explorer from being cooked and eaten. I was one of the Israelites fanning my arms in front of the golden calf, though not one of the dancing girls exuding guilt in close-up after Moses' sermon. I was pretty enough, but not something enough to fight the riptide pulling me out to sea in which the pretty extras drowned. Hollywood years are like dog years. An age is a funny thing. When I first met Gabor, he and I were the same age, but I was always older. Didi also was my age, but we were the same age, perhaps because we both like men to whom age is so important. People used to ask Didi and me how we met, a question meant to remind us that we were an unlikely couple. But how little that mattered at first. We had so much in common. We were French and far from home. We were young and attractive. At a party, I'd reply, across a crowded room. Actually, it was a party at the home of Douglas Fairbanks. He had a private auto racetrack and invited movie stars to watch their famous friends drive. <laughs> Didi knew someone who knew someone. I knew someone who knew someone else. We were the only French guests except for a costume designer who ignored us, afraid we might know that she had been a seamstress at home. It was lovely to meet Didi and chat in French about the Americans' disgusting food and <laughs> and infantile social customs. <laughs> it was Hollywood. Crazy things went on. But knowing that the actor who plays the charioteer can only perform sexually in the presence of a chattering, ring-tailed monkey is not the same thing as going to bed with the actor and his ape. <laughs> despite the skimpy toga, despite the doll baby I clutched, clutched as the madman rushed by, despite what all Hollywood assumed about a pretty blonde French extra, I had never been kissed off screen. I knew that men loved other men, that women fell in love with women, but no one had ever told me that there were men like Didi who only made love with other men, but who liked kissing women. As he drove me home from the party in his gorgeous Bugatti, he pulled off the road and embraced me so forcefully that when I got back to my apartment, the seams of the upholstered front seat were imprinted on my back. Didn't it mean anything that he asked me to marry him on our first date? It was obvious he loved me, though he never said so. Sometimes we necked for hours, then he stopped and pulled away. He was controlling his animal instincts, saving me from marriage. We were married by a judge in the Los Angeles County Courthouse. Then the auto business called Didi back to Europe. Chased as two cherubs, we traveled by train to New York and by ocean liner to Rome, where we were married again in St. Peter's. Then we went to Venice for our honeymoon. Venice was wet and cold. I blamed everything on the weather. Didi wouldn't get out from under the blankets and wouldn't touch me beneath them. Would our lives have been different if we'd gotten married in June? Then, a little late, don't you think, he decided to tell me the truth. So it wasn't the weather or the Venetian climate. He'd assumed I'd known all along. Apparently, everyone did. Venice is a beautiful city, but I've never liked it. Didi married me for a third time in a church in France to please or spite his pious brother, who, when we met at one of those hellish French Sunday family lunches, asked Didi right in front of me, are you sure it's even legal? At that same time, Armand asked if he might have seen any of the films in which I'd appeared. I said no, most likely they'd never been shown in France. Later I learned that Armand never went to the movies. Apparently, the church had no problem with opium, or if it did, Armand ignored it. <laughs> he only smoked at night. Armand was one of the founders of the Order of the Legion of Joan of Arc, a right-wing veterans organization with a small private army and close ties to the military and the pope. Why direct your prayers to a loving God when you can have the crown of thorns and the martyred French soldiers flying up to Jesus? Because of Armand's nationalism and his prejudice against foreigners, I was literally trembling the first time I invited Gabor to dinner. I meant to seat my friend and my brother-in-law at opposite ends of the table, but circumstances intervened. 
Armand was high, but not high enough to miss the fact that Gabor spoke with an accent. There was an incident involving a grape that mortified Gabor. Somehow he'd gotten the idea that polite society sliced grapes in half with knives, and his flew across the table and practically hit Armand. Luckily, I was able to help Gabor see the humor in it. It took me years to appreciate my brother-in-law's good qualities, but I will say that by the time of his death, I loved him like a brother. We learned not to talk about politics or religion and to put the past behind us. It was Armand who, in a sober moment, taught me how to drive and gave me, as a belated wedding gift, the beautiful Rossignol sedan that I still treasure and occasionally take for a spin, though usually now with a driver. Even then, when I went out with friends, I preferred to have a chauffeur. I felt obliged to keep up with some world-class drinkers, and the cocktails at the Chameleon Club were notoriously strong. By then, I would learned to have things my way, an accomplishment for a woman. My way meant never being bored. Boredom frightened me as much, or possibly worse, than death. Only later, looking back at that time, did I understand that boredom was a luxury and a blessing. The first years I knew Gabor Tsenyi were not the happiest in my marriage, but later I turned back to Didi for reasons I will explain. I can't recall who introduced me to Gabor. I think we met in a cafe. He seemed like a charming man with an adorable accent and unusually lively dark eyes. Then he showed me his photos. After that, all I wanted was to see what he saw. That was partly why we spent so many evenings at the Chameleon. Gabor was always on the prowl for photographic subjects. Eventually, I saw the world as a series of scenes that belonged in his photos, whether he knew it or not. For Gabor, the Chameleon Club was a treasure trove, the beauty and style of those dancers. Watching them, I'd ponder what it meant, really meant to be a man or a woman. Is it our clothes, our sexual parts, our bodies and brains and souls? In one of Lionel's books, he describes me as staring at the dance floor in search of information. He had come closer to the truth than he could have known. At first, I liked the variety shows, especially the sailors and sailorettes. Contortionists are like magicians. You never get tired of trying to figure out how it's done. The crowd was very appreciative. There was a lot of whooping and whistling. It was relaxing to let down your hair and make noise. The club took a turn for the worse when it inaugurated a new review by the sea, by the beautiful sea, that produced two unlikely stars, Arlette Jumeau and Lou Villar. Everyone had been excited when the owner, Yvonne, announced a show with an undersea theme. What delightful fish would her choreographer, Pavel, produce? A girl costumed as Neptune in a fake beard and trident sang a scorcher about how lonely it was at the bottom of the sea. Then the lights flickered, cymbals crashed, a gale swept over the ocean, a belly dancer fell off a cardboard ship. She shimmied while Neptune leered, then the two women, the sea god and his spangled queen, fell in love. No one could have predicted, predicted how distasteful Arlette's routine would eventually become, but I had a premonition the first time I saw The Little Mermaid. The audience knew about Arlette and Lou, Theirs was the stormy romance spiked by public brawls, brawls over Arlette's boyfriend, Eddie, of whom Lou was pathologically jealous. Surrounded by squirming aquatic creatures, the mermaid and sailor danced. Rather, the mermaid wriggled and the sailor shifted from foot to foot. Still, the heat between them was clear to everyone in the room. Lou, who wasn't especially tall but was broad in the shoulders and chest, lifted Arlette and spun her like an airplane propeller. The spotlight found Arlette's bobbed hair shellacked in metallic gold. Stretching out her soft white arm, she began to sing in a quavering, adenoidal voice, nasal even by the standards of the day, a song about a drowning mermaid and the sailors who tried to save her. It was troubling how quickly the, sailors, the spectators threw themselves into the game. During the verse about the Chinese sailor, Lou pulled her eyelids in pantomime, struggling to lift the mermaid. The crowd jeered until an Asian gentleman dressed as Anna Mae Wong cried out from a banquette, mes amis, s'il vous plaît. Several audience members shouted that they were sorry. 
When the English sailor Lou donned a British Navy cap also failed, everyone laughed. From the wings, a bass voice growled the opening bars of rural Britannia. When the German sailor Lou in a Wagnerian helmet with horns gave up, the Germans, who knew there were so many in the room, made it sound like a good idea to let the mermaid drown. My discomfort increased when the tone of the little mermaid got uglier. Maybe the fans were getting bored, so I let up the ante by adding two new verses, one about an American sailor and the other about a Jew. The American, in a top hat and uniform spangled with stars and stripes, succeeded in saving the mermaid, though when it came time to have sex, the Yank couldn't perform and ran away. A few seconds later, the Jewish sailor shambled into the spotlight. In a prayer shawl and yarmulke, Lou shrugged and turned up her palms in the gesture that had become shorthand for the weak, fake, innocent Jew. There were plenty of Jews in the audience, but there was none of the protest, however mild, that Arlette got from the other groups. No one spoke, no one breathed. It was one thing to joke about Germans, but quite another to mock the Jewish sailor for refusing to save the mermaid unless he was paid in full up front. Arlette stopped singing. The band fell silent. Tension jittered the air. Finally, Arlette waved to the band and flashed the musicians a grin. They picked up their drumsticks and raised their trumpets. She sang the verse about the French sailor who bravely jumps into the waves and catches the mermaids in his muscular arms just as, as she's going under for the last time. He rescues her, they marry, and proudly produce a dozen healthy French babies. Everything is forgotten, or at least forgiven. The German, the Chinaman, the Englishman, the American, the Jew, everyone's in on the joke. Lou picked Arlette up again and spun her in triumph. The shortest of the dancers pranced out in baby bonnets, fishtails, and sailor suits. Bravo, shouted the crowd. Why didn't anyone say anything? Why did no one object? It was Lionel Maine who finally made the fuss that the rest of us should have made. Maybe it was his being American without European manners or the European fear that a relative might be watching. Or maybe it was the fact that by the time Arlette added the extra verses, his belly dancer girlfriend Fatima had been forced to leave Paris for not having her papers in order. Perhaps it was just that Lionel could get aggressive when he drank. I never understood why Gabor loved him or thought he was so brilliant. He was the sort of cowboy cavemen other men admire. I always had mixed feelings about him. I admired his spirit, but he annoyed and insulted me both. When he looked at me, he saw an old witch, though I was younger than he was. One night, as the applause for Arlette was beginning to subside, Lionel started swearing. His French deteriorated. He shouted something about a military parade and puppets and Arlette not having a soul until Fat Bernard and one of the African dancers hustled him out of the club. Gabor looked as helpless as I felt. We should have followed Lionel out, but what could we have done? A woman in very high heels and a short Hungarian worried about his camera. Later we learned that Lionel had been beaten up. I will forever feel guilty for not having helped him, though later I would make up for my momentary inaction. Arlette single, signaled the musicians and repeated the last verse. The audience cheered as if she'd staggered up from a knockdown. Why was I surprised? Everyone wants to be on the winning side. I looked across the table at Gabor. I wanted to tell him what? That he and I were outsiders. We didn't carry on like maniacs every time we heard the word France. We had friends from everywhere, painters from Russia and Japan, Romanian sculptors, Jewish composers, Argentinian medical students. After the show, Lou, who had changed into a tuxedo, sat in a booth with Arlette in a sequined evening gown. They greeted the adoring pilgrims who trooped over to pay their respects. I watched for a break, then introduced myself. I told them that the famous photographer Gabor Tseni wanted to take their picture. I said the session would take place in his studio and they would get paid. Arlette gave me a filthy grin. What would they be wearing and what exactly did he want them to do? I said, you'll be sitting as you are now, dressed as you are now. All they had to do was show up, spend a few hours, and collect their money. I waved Gabor over. We set a date. Gabor put his arm around me. 
Lou had her arm around Arlette. For a moment, we remained like that, two couples, each entwined. Then we moved away and let the next group of fans approach to say how much they'd enjoyed the performance. Thank you. <laughs>